We're continuing our study of the Gospel of John. We left off last week in chapter 3, and now chapter 4. Each one of these chapters is just loaded with great stuff. Loaded with great stuff. So, uh, John chapter 4. Now, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making more, making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, so that's important to note. Andrea, I think, asked last week about that. So we hear about in, in chapter 3, verse 22, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea. There he remained with them and baptized. So what does that mean? He and his disciples went there and baptized. Well, who was baptized? And what are we talking about? We're not talking about a Trinitarian sacramental baptism there. We're talking about the baptism of repentance that John was doing. And the disciples of John are now the disciples of Jesus. And Jesus has kind of picked up that ministry and, and is continuing on. He, and grabbed the baton and is, is continued. So the, the, but this is simply a baptism of repentance to prepare them for what's coming. Okay, so to prepare them for what's coming. So the, um, the baptism that we see here in chapter 3, verse 22, and chapter 4 is not a sacramental baptism. That's only going to be after the resurrection of Jesus. More on that later. Okay, so chapter 4, verse 3. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. So in John's gospel, this is one of the things that's different about John's gospel, among a, a myriad of other differences, is John tells us that Jesus is going to Galilee and Judea. Galilee, Judea. And he, he makes a big point of that because he shows that there's a contrast between the faith that you would find in Judea versus the faith you find in Galilee. And now, if you're a Jew in the first century, where are you going to find good, strong faith? Where would you find good, you know, righteous individuals? Who so you'd think, well, in Judea, in Jerusalem, with the Pharisees. No. What John shows us is that the places that Jesus encounters great faith is in the places you would least expect it. Now, this is something you find in the other Gospels. You find Jesus walking up to a tax collector, saying, come, follow me. And the guy gets up and follows him. A Pharisee would never have done something like that. Oh, look at that tax collector over there. They'd spit on him and walk by. Jesus walks up to the tax collector and says, you, hey, come follow me. You can be one of my disciples too. What? Really? And jumps up and walks away from his tax booth and never, never returns. That's Matthew. Matthew did that. So Jesus goes out seeking seeking disciples in places you don't think you would find them, or that lost sheep, right? He goes out seeking for that lost sheep. And so we find him doing that throughout John's gospel, and this is one of the themes in John's gospel, a major theme, how you find faith in places you, don't, you wouldn't expect it. And so we're going to see here Samaria, okay? So he's leaving Judea, where he, where he had some difficulty, and he's heading back to heading back to. Galilee, okay, back, uh, back to the place where things tend to be a little better off. On. Okay, so he had to pass through Samaria. Why? Many commentators have seen that as John furthering this very point. He had to go through Samaria. Why? Why Samaria? If, if you think of, of the promised land, right, the promised land, you've got... Uh, Here's the, the Mediterranean Sea over here. All right? Here's the, the Sea of Galilee. There's the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Okay? There's Jerusalem right there. Capernaum up here. Jesus spent most of his time, according to the Synoptic Gospels, up there in that northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. But how do you normally travel between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea or Jerusalem? You take the Jordan River, okay? It's an easy path. When I, if you, some of you have been with us, if, if you ever go, if this summer if you go with us, we'll drive this road. When you're, you're in Jerusalem, 
you go from Jerusalem down downhill to Jericho. And when you hit Jericho, which is right there by the Jordan, you then head up the Jordan Valley up to Galilee. And you make your trip around the top, and there you are up in Capernaum. Okay? By the way, any of you who have ever lived in California, unbelievable resemblance. If you've ever lived in California, the similarity of the Salinas Valley to this Jordan Valley is absolutely shocking. I grew up in this area, right? in, in Paso Robles, Tascadero, Alejandro, you know what I'm talking about. The, the grade, the San Luis Obispo, the Cuesta grade, that hilly area there where Santa Margarita is, okay? That area is Jerusalem, okay? You're heading from there down the grade, here we are, and you come up along the Salinas River, and you get to Salinas, the delta that goes out into the Pacific Ocean. That's Galilee. And when you drive up that Jordan Valley on in a bus, I mean, it's like I was having deja vu. It's like I was driving up from the trip from Atascadero to Salinas. It was, it's identical. The same type of hillsides on both sides because it's east and west and everything. It's really amazing. And those of you who have not been that far down, if you're in California, the San Jose or the Santa Clara Valley is very similar as well. The trip from Prunedale up to San Jose, almost identical valley as well. Anyway, if you're not from California, you go to the Holy Land with us next summer. You can see this as well. The, um, this is the normal way you go. You do not go through Samaria. Samaria, this is the hill country. This is not an easy path. The trip from Galilee to Jerusalem is about a four-day journey by foot. To go through Samaria, I don't know how long it would take, but it would certainly take a lot longer. And you're going to go through the region of Samaria? The Samaritans and the Jews don't get along. The last major historical event we know of between the Jews and the Samaritans is when Judas Maccabeus conquered the region and burned down their temple on Mount Gerizim. Not very ecumenical. So these people do not get along. And you're going to see that tension right here. So Jesus is heading into, you know, bad lands with his disciples. Can you imagine the disciples? What are we going to this way for? This is not the way we normally go, Jesus. This is not the easy route. And this is dangerous. We can get killed. And besides, stinking Samaritans that run clean. So he had to pass through Samaria, right? Many commentators see that as John pointed out, Jesus is going looking for disciples. So he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sikar near the field that Jacob gave John, chapter 4, verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. This is, if you want to do some research, that's at the end of the book of Genesis when Jacob did that in his promise to Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and, and so Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. It's lunchtime. Okay, so two very important points to note. One, quite obvious, it's lunchtime. So that's going to be the theme as we're going to continue about the food thing, right? The disciples are going to go get some food. At the end, we're going to hear about a food issue. So it's lunchtime. The, uh, the other theme that is not necessarily so noticeable, though John screams it at us, but I think most people may not pick up on it, is, is about this well that was given to Joseph by Jacob. So, okay, great. Joseph got a well. Yeah, Joseph, one of those, yeah, the, the coat of many colors. I remember seeing the Technicolor, you know, coat broad sh Broadway show. Okay, this is John reminding you of the tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. It's not just that these two people had some recent spats over burning each other's temples down, okay? This is going all the way back to Jacob. The tension between the Samaritans and the Jews goes all the way back to Jacob. How so? Jacob had two wives. Remember, he saw Rachel, 
at the well and wanted to marry her. So he made a deal with Laban, her father, and worked for seven years. Okay. And then Laban said, well, yeah, but uh, that's not what's going to happen, right? So he, Laban pulled a trick on him. He Jacobed Jacob, right? He, he took the clothing of the older sister Leah and put them, the wedding garment of the older sister Leah, on, uh, I'm sorry, Rachel, of the younger, onto the older sister Leah. So he took Rachel's, the younger girl's wedding garment, who was supposed to be getting married, and put them onto Leah, and then sent Leah into the tent, right? Now, he said, how could this happen? How could there be confusion? You remember in the morning, he wakes up, and behold, it's Leah. You guys know the story in the book of Genesis. And Jacob says to Laban, how come you tricked me, right? What was going on? Well, one, they were probably drinking. Two, it's before Edison and light bulbs, okay? You've got can, you know, a little lamp light, oil lamp here or there. She's fully veiled, and she's Rachel's sister, okay? She probably sounds like her and probably looks a little like her. Okay, so, so in the morning, Jacob wakes up, and whoops, it's the wrong girl. So Jacob then asks Laban if he can still have the younger one. Now, you remember, why did Laban do this to him? Well, it's in the story, right? He says, it's not done in our country, son, to give the younger before the elder, which is a commentary back on what happened earlier. When Jacob, using his older brother's clothing, had tricked the father, right, into getting the blessing. So now the older one gets the blessing, right? She is now married, and the blessing of the Bible, of course, fertility, right? She gets the blessing. She's married, wearing the, other, the younger girl's clothing, tricked by the father-in-law. You can see it's quite obvious what's going on here to Jacob. There's a theme throughout Genesis. You reap what you sow. That is a, a common theme in the book. All right, so, so what happens then? He ends up marrying both girls. He marries Leah. But then at the end of the wedding week, after seven days, he gets to marry Rachel also. And for, of course, working another seven years. Seven being that covenantal, that contract number. Now, what should Jacob have done in this situation? He, Jacob, throughout the story in the book of Genesis, he will never let God be God. Jacob is always trying to do, to run the show his, himself. From the very beginning, right? He was supposed to be, according to a prophecy given to his mother, the one who would eventually rule over the elder. So what does he try to do along with his mother, Rebecca? They try to force the hand of God, force the whole process, right? And in their mind, obviously, it seems the, the end justifies the means. Well, it's the same, same thing going on with this situation, God has dealt him a hand, and it's, a, it's result, the result of his actions earlier. And so Leah is his wife, and that's what it should have been. And nowhere will you find in the Bible that, that taking multiple wives is considered a blessing from God. This is always shown to be something that is contrary to God's will. You find it among the patriarchs, you will find it. But if you ever done a Bible study on Genesis with me, and if you didn't, you can go back and listen to those in the archive. It is quite obvious that polygamy is something that is contrary to God's plan. And in the book of Genesis, you always find it. When you find them on the patriarchs, it's always problematic. It's never a happy family in the mountains of Utah. Okay, so the, um, the purpose of is that, that theme of the of the the. You, you reap what you sow, but Jacob isn't going to accept that. Jacob says, no, no, I want Rachel. I want to marry Rachel. So he ends up with two wives, which you know right off the bat is going to cause a problem. He got what was coming to him, and, but he doesn't want to accept that. And so now he's going to get more problems. So he ends up marrying two girls, these two sisters. And you read the story, you hear right off the bat, you hear about tension, problems, fighting. Com co competition between the two girls, and you can understand why. Leah ends up bearing Judah, and Rachel ends up bearing Joseph. And Judah becomes the firstborn of Leah. You know, Reuben gets passed over, Simeon and Levi get passed over because of things they did to their father and other things in the book of Genesis. 
So as you read the end of the book of Genesis, Judah gets the special firstborn blessing from his father Jacob before he dies as the firstborn of Leah who will take over the tribe. He will rule. But if you read the story carefully, you'll see Joseph got a special blessing too. His two sons got to inherit with their uncles, which means Joseph got a firstborn blessing too. That's called a double blessing, a double portion. So now Jacob's guaranteed a problem. Now you've got two tribes that are going to war. Those descendants of Joseph and the descendants of Judah. And as you read the rest of the book of Judges and the verse in 2 Samuel, you can see it going on over and over. The, the primary ruling tribe from, uh, uh, from Joseph is Ephraim because of that blessing with his right hand. You can read that again at the end of the book of Genesis. And so you get the Ephraimites versus the Judaites. That's going to happen during the time of Solomon. And the whole split in the north and the, north and the south is going to be based on that. But even earlier, you see this going on between the two girls. Look at the end of the book of Genesis. When you have Joseph, the firstborn son of Rachel, dad's favorite boy, getting the special clothing, right? The long cloak. The long cloak, which means he's going to be a ruler. And the whole tension, throwing him into the pit, that's all about this tension between the two groups. So then you see it come up again with, uh, with Saul being the king. He's of the, what is Saul? Saul's a Benjaminite, right, from Rachel. And then who is the, the king that rules after him? David from the tribe of Judah. But that doesn't end the problem. And again, if you read the story between David and Saul as, as David's taking over, and when, when Saul's dead and David starts to rule, there's still a tension between those who are following the Benjaminites and those who are going to follow the Judaites. Then finally, David unites the whole kingdom. This is in 2 Samuel uh, 4. And then in 5, he conquers Jerusalem, and 6, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not over. When Solomon, David's son, comes on the throne and messes things up. Then an Ephraimite, Jeroboam, an Ephraimite, son of jo Joseph, or a descendant of Joseph from Ephraim, causes a split in the kingdom between the north and the south. The northern kingdom becomes known as the Samaritans, Samaria, because they used a, north, a hill up in the north that was owned by a guy named Shemer, and they called it, therefore, the city of Samaria but you don't have an S in Greek, so it's Samaria. So then, the, so, so the Samaritans, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, the tribe, the kingdom of Judah, ruled by the Judeites. The northern kingdom, the Ephraimites are ruling the rest of the tribes, so it's called Israel, but it's also called Samaria. The tension goes on. When the Babylonians, when the Assyrians come in, they conquer the northern kingdom that split, broke away. And then the Babylonians come in and conquer the southern kingdom. But then when the Jews return from Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem. They find who's there? Samaritans are hanging out. And the Samaritans say, hey, would you mind if we help rebuild the temple with you? We worship the same God. And the Jews say, get away from us. You have nothing to do with us. And so they split. And the Samaritans start throwing rocks at the Jews to keep them from rebuilding the temple without them. And then it continues all the way to finally they give up. They go up north to, to Mount Gerizim. And they build a temple of their own so they can worship Yahweh on their own. And then Judas Maccabeus goes up there and destroys it. Okay, with all that in mind, here's a Samaritan woman now with a Jew. All right, so think of that tension. Verse 5, so he came to the city of Samaria called Sikar near the field that Jacob gave to his favorite son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and so Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. By the way, this is one of uh, three very important examples in the Gospel of John that Irenaeus used to, in his Adversus Heresies, his Against Heresies, to prove that Jesus had a real human body. This was something that was doubted after the Judaizer heresy was put down, then the the heresy that comes in from the Gentiles is dualism. The, uh, the lack of appreciation for or the rejection of the material world. 
something that still haunts the world today even right we ask somebody what happens when you when you when you die oh i'll go off and float off into the clouds without my body and then i'll be for all eternity in the clouds with the angels that's dualism that's all heresy no no jesus came so that he would he conquered sin and death when he returns he's gonna you, you may go float off to be with jesus for a bit but he's bringing you back home and you're gonna eat your body back and raise you from the dead and we're gonna return to the garden of eden so the, the heresy of dualism, this rejection of the material world and the goodness of the body, also affected people's belief in the, in the body uh, and, the, and the human nature of Jesus. And so, the, so John had to fight against that and prove, no, 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 Jesus had a real human body, right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Here he gets tired. Clearly he has to obviously have a real human body. Uh, as Aaron S. points out later on, he's going to cry when he hears about Lazarus and he sees the weeping of his sisters. Later on, we'll see him bleed when he's stabbed with a spear. And Irenaeus points this out. This is, this is proof Jesus had a real human body. And, and Irenaeus is, is on good ground there. He's, he's pointing out the very spots that John used. In fact, John had a number of examples in the gospel. But Irenaeus points to these three in particular to prove because the heresy of dualism continued on even to Irenaeus' time. And in fact, in many ways, it still continues today. All right, more on that another, another day. So it says he was tired. It was the sixth hour. It's lunchtime. Verse 7, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. No! From a Samaritan woman? They're perpetually unclean. According to the rabbis, they menstruated continuously. Now, obviously, it's nonsense, of course. But, but that's what the rabbi said. They're, they're, so, they're so unclean, the Samaritans, that their women never stop bleeding. Okay, which for the Jews would be considered unclean. The Jewish women, oh, they're only unclean for a little bit. But the Samaritan women, they're always unclean. Stay away from them. So... A, a woman, she's unclean. She's, got a, she's touching a water vessel, which is unclean. And you're going to drink that? So Jesus, a Jew, which is going to be pointed out in a second, says, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. It's lunchtime, right? The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? This has never happened before. Jews don't come to Samaria, and they surely don't ask women for drinks. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Okay, so this is, I wish we had three hours to unpack that verse. Okay, there's a lot there. Notice John has pointed out that we've got a tension here between Jews and Samaritans. Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. And that's the key that unlocks what's said next year. Jesus is talking to a woman, yes, but she's a Samaritan. And Jesus, in his human nature, is a Jew. So there's, there, there are at least three to four layers of conversation happening here. We don't have time to deal with them all, but we'll hit as many as we can, as quickly as we can. So if you knew... The gift of God. And what's the gift of God? You got to go back to the prologue, right? The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, or the true grace, the true gift, is given by Jesus Christ. So what Moses gave was preliminary. Jesus is the fullness of it. What? The law, the word of God. The word of God. If you knew, if you knew the gift of God, and who is it saying to you, give me a drink? You would have asked him for a drink. Why is he saying that? The Samaritans have a version of the Pentateuch. But it's different from the version the Jews have. The law that the Jews have is the five books of Moses as you have in your Bible. But the, what's called the Samaritan Pentateuch has some differences. In every place it talks about building an altar, worshiping God, they always throw in Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim. 
And so this is a big division between the Samaritans and the Jews. They look in their Bible and it says, in their five books of Moses, says, we're supposed to build the temple for God on Mount Gerizim. Well, that's because the Samaritan scribes squeezed it in there. The Jews don't have that. And there's, no, 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 there's nowhere in the five books of Moses that says where you're supposed to build it, except where God causes his name to dwell, which is only revealed later on during the time of David. So the, this is a big tension between the two. Where is your temple going to be? And don't forget the recent history. They built their temple on Mount Gerizim based upon their corrupted text or built it there and then corrupted their text. And Judas Maccabeus had knocked it down. Okay, so if you knew the gift of God, the, if you knew the law, if you knew the God, what God had given at Mount Sinai, if you had it in its purity, and who it is that is saying to you, that is the law himself, right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us, which is supposed to remind you of Sinai. Give me a drink. You would have asked him a drink, and he would have given you a drink of living water. So we're hearing the story of the Sinai event. When they came out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, right? And they made their way to the Sinai Peninsula. How did they get to the Sinai Peninsula? You remember the story? They crossed the sea, and they get to the other side. Okay, the crossing of the sea is Exodus 14 and 15. They get to the other side, Exodus 16, and they're hungry. And God rains down from heaven, quail and manna. We've talked about this in our Bible study. Again, if anyone's listening and hasn't heard those, you can go into the archive. How do they get the people from the wilderness of clay to Mount Sinai? Do you think this is an easy trip? You have somewhere around 10 million people, 10 million people with cattle and sheep, okay? How are you going to do this? And there's, you're in a wilderness of clay, so God gave them food, manna and quail, but of course you got to have water. So as soon as they eat the quail and the manna, they're thirsty. And in Exodus 17, they cry out to God, they're about to die. How, how long can you live in perfect condition if I gave you all the water you wanted to drink and threw you in a nice air-conditioned room, put you in a lazy boy and said, don't move? How long do you have before you have irreversible physiological damage? Three days. After three days, you, there, there are problems that begin to develop that you cannot fix. Now, if you give someone water after five days, they will live if they've made it to that point. You can maybe revive them, but they will always carry with them irreversible physiological damage. Okay, so they're in the wilderness. No air conditioning. There's no water. This is farthest from the ideal conditions. You've got maybe a few hours, maybe a day or two, and people are going to start dying. The only water source nearby is the Red Sea. It's salt water. They have a little bit of water maybe and some jugs and some, some thermoses and some canteens. That's about it. There's no water. So they cry out in fear of death, and God says to Moses, strike the rock and make water come forth, right? And most people think that that's where it happened, right there. But if you read the story, God says, Moses, I want you to get some of the elders of Israel, and you're going to head to Mount Sinai, and you're going to stand at the foot of the mountain, and there you're going to strike a rock, okay? So what he does, he goes, all, Moses with a few representatives, maybe, you know, 12 guys, we'll say, from the 12 tribes, heads down to Mount Sinai. At the foot of the mountain, God says, strike that one rock right there. I'm going to stand on this rock. You strike it. He strikes the rock at the foot of the mountain, and water flows all the way back to the camp. And they drink. Why would he do this? Because the purpose is to get to the people to Mount Sinai. If he gives them water here, you think they're going to leave that spot? No way. If they've got a spring of water right there, they've got beachfront property. They've got manna and quail dropping out of the sky without a 12 gauge. And now they got water flowing. What else could you want in life? So they strike a rock at the, mount, at the foot of the mountain where God wants them to go. And now they follow the stream of water to the source. Flowing water. In Hebrew, 
we say running water in English, right? Running water or flowing water. It's uh, think of running water. You hear that in English. You've heard it all your life. It just means water that's moving. Well, it sounds kind of funny. It's an English idiom. Running water? You mean like running? Well, it's the same in Hebrew. They have an idiom to talk about moving water. They call it living water. Living water. Because for the Hebrews, something that moved was alive. If it didn't move, it wasn't alive. So it's living water. In Hebrew, now in your Bible, wherever you look in the Old Testament, you see running water or flowing water. The Hebrew word there is actually living water. Living water. And then that comes out here in the story. Look at this. He says, if you do the gift of God, that is, if you recognize me, he who is speaking to you, the Torah that was given at Mount Sinai in all of its purity, before it was corrupted by the Samaritans, and who needs to say you give me a drink? You would have asked him for a drink, right? It's Jesus who is the source of living water. The law was given on Mount Sinai, and it's from the law that the water then flows. So the law of God was understood to be a source of living water, the Holy Spirit. The, the, when you read the law of God, the Holy Spirit flows into you and gives you life. Think of Psalm 1. Psalm, Psalm 1. Think of that. You're like a tree planted by running water. Or think of Ezekiel's dream, his vision of in the restored kingdom, when everything was restored, the temple would be rebuilt, and then water would flow out from underneath the temple to give life to all the, the earth. Uh, think of Sirach 24. There you have it exactly. He says, the law of God, he tells you as you read the whole story, is the source of the living water. Okay? So that's all based upon this original story. And this and Ezekiel's vision that someday water would flow out from the temple to give water again is what Jesus is telling him right here. Jesus is the temple of God. He is the place where God dwells on earth. And he is the fulfillment then of Ezekiel's vision. Okay, there's a lot more here, but we can't do it all. Okay, so uh, and the woman said to him, Sir, you don't have a bucket. Right? So there's a problem. You're not making any sense. The heat's gotten to you, Mr. Jew, because I know it's hot out here, but that well down there is deep, and you don't have a bucket. How are you going to get me the living water? Right? What is this? If you go down the bottom of that well, this isn't stagnant water. It's an aquifer. You dig down there, and the water's trickling and moving along. Beautiful, ice-cold spring water down there. So... She says, how are you going to give me the running water? Uh, you asked me for a drink from my bucket, and, and you're, you're telling me that you're going to get me a drink? You, you can't get down there without a bucket and bring up the water. So she doesn't understand what he's saying. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Right? You Judaite? Right? You have the tension between the Jews and the Josephites. Right? Rachel and Leah. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from himself and his sons and his cattle? The answer is, of course, yes. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Will never thirst. Hold your hand there. Flip back to Sirach. Again, if you have never read Sirach 24, you better read it. This is an extremely important text for understanding a number of New Testament texts, and especially uh, the Gospel of John. In fact, I know a, a guy who was, I don't think he ever finished it, but he was working on his whole dissertation, was on the use of the wisdom literature, particularly the book of Sirach, in the Gospels. Tragically, the book of Sirach is unknown to most Protestants because it's not in their Bible, but um, it was certainly known to the Jews. In fact, this guy working on his dissertation was a Methodist. I said to him, but you don't have Sirach in your Bible as a Methodist. How are you writing a dissertation on the use of Sirach in the New Testament? He said, well, what am I going to do about it? It's a, it's a fact. It's all over the New Testament. So I'm writing my dissertation on it. All right, so Sirach 24. Look at this. He's, wisdom is this gift of God, which was implanted at 
uh, Sinai in the, in the people and then eventually in Jerusalem. And, and it says, verse 23, look at this chap, chapter 24, verse 23. All this is the book of the covenant of the Most High, the law which Moses commanded us. And look at it. It fills men with wisdom like Pishom and like the tigers, the time of the first fruits, and makes them all understand like Euphrates, like the Jordan, like Gihon, right? And it becomes like a river that becomes a lake. And it, this is all the image from Ezekiel. Verse 30, I went forth, it says of itself, wisdom. I went forth like a canal from a river, like a water channel into the garden. And I said, I will water my orchard and drench my garden plot. And lo, my canal became a river and my river became a sea. I will again make instruction, learning, right? The teaching from the Torah happened again. All right. So again, if you don't know the background of that, Ezekiel 47, you got to read that beautiful image, a dream of Ezekiel, a vision of the, of the future restoration. All right. Now with that in mind, look what it says in verse 31 i'm sorry verse 21 those who eat of me will hunger for more and those who drink of me will thirst for more do you hear that will thirst for more that's the torah of the old testament the wisdom that was given and it it is it is a it is so wonderful that people want more of it and they want more of it but john's gospel and you can turn back now will show that Jesus is the fullness of this. So that when you have Jesus, you're no longer hungry. You're no longer thirsty. And this is the point you're getting here in chapter four. You're going to get it in chapter six. Turn with me to chapter six for a second, just to see this point. We don't have time to deal with it today, tonight, the whole chapter, but look at chapter six, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Right? That's Sirach 24 right there. It's all over the New Testament. But here in the, in the Samaritan woman, Jesus is saying to the Samaritan woman, I am the fullness of what was given at Mount Sinai. The source, it, it come, come to me at Mount Sinai and you'll never thirst again. Okay, so uh, he says, the water I will give will spring up. A spring of, a spring of water welling up into eternal life. It will give eternal life, not just temporary life in the desert. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water and I may drink of it and not have to come here and draw water anymore. Right? She said, oh, that's a nice deal. I can drink it and then I never have to come out with a bucket anymore. That's a fantastic deal. So Jesus said to her, sure, I'll give you a drink. Go call your husband. Right? He is, I am the truth. Right? The truth. The light in the darkness. Right? That's the Torah. Psalm uh, 119, the light in the darkness shines, right? So he asks her about her life, and suddenly the lights turn on. Right? So she's asked for it. So he gives her a drink. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman said, I have no husband. He said, you are right in saying I had no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you, that you are with uh, right now is not your husband. Oh, oops. Now, this is also probably a commentary on the relationship of the Samaritans and the Jews. Again, the Samaritans are not just the northern kingdom. When the Assyrians conquered that region, they brought in five pagan nations who brought in their pagan gods. And in the Old Testament, the god was understood to be your husband, Baal. And, the, and, and you, the, the people of Israel, or the, any of the nations, were, was the wife of the God. So there's probably another layer going on here. We're not only talking about Jesus and this woman and, and her sordid past, but there's, remember that conversation that's going to continue all through the chapter between the Jews and the Samaritans. You've had five husbands, you Northern Samaritans, right? You've been worshiping five other gods, actually five other pantheons. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive you're a prophet, <laughs> right? And she doesn't know this larger conversation going on, but she is, she's, Perceives she, this guy knows about my life. He knows not about her life, but of course the whole life of the Samaritan people. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, Gerizim, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, "Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain, Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what." 
He says, we worship what we, I'm sorry, I say, you worship what you do not know. So remember that theme, if you knew the gift of God? So the Samaritans don't really, they're not in covenantal knowledge. They're not in proper union with the covenantal people and with God. So he says, you worship what you do not know. You're worshiping the right God, but the relationship is not right. And that also is probably a commentary. Again, you've had five husbands, and the one you're with is not your husband. There might be another layer there going on. Uh, Jesus is the husband, right? The husband, you, the one you're with is not your husband. So probably another layer. The text is so rich. All right, so anyway, he says, you do not, uh, you worship, you Samaritans, worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. What does that mean? If you go back to the, the, the split between the north and the south, what happened? God had promised them as through David and his descendants, 2 Samuel 7, that the nation would be protected. When the northern kingdom broke away, they were conquered by the Assyrians. And so salvation is from the Jews. The prophets all prophesied that someday the Jews would return. There were Jews, of course, never even left Jerusalem, or some that remained. But they would, after the Babylon exile, Jews would rebuild Jerusalem, and God would be there, and everything would be restored through the Jews, through the Judaites, through the tribe of Judah, through the son of Leah. Right? There's tension. It goes all the way back to Genesis. He says, but the hour is coming, right? So I just went through the Jews. Through the Jews. David is, this, is of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is son of David. And the son of David is the Christ, the long-awaited king, right, who would restore everything. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So it's not whether you're, you're a Jew or whether or not you're a Samaritan. Salvation comes from the Jews, right? How is that? Because Jesus is the king, right, the savior. And that's what they had rejected back then. But, but it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Samaritan. There is a new covenant being formed here. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, and as if you couldn't see it coming here, I know that the Messiah, that is, he is called the Christ, is coming, and he will reveal all things to us. Right? The long-awaited return of the king. She understood what he meant. Salvation is from the Jews, right? Second Samuel 7, the line of David, of the tribe of Judah, is the one, is the king, the rightful king, the one through whom God would save you from your enemies run about. So I, I know what you're talking about. I know that, uh, there's a long way the Jews always talk about it, that the king is going to return, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who has the spirit, right? Think of the richness here. The Christ, the one that has the spirit, right? The wa living water is the spirit that flows and brings people to Jesus. And so look what happens. She says, uh, he said, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now the English doesn't do justice here. In the Greek, I who speak to you, ego ini, I am he. This is, this is the Greek translation of the Hebrew, of the divine name from Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. It's all over John's gospel. And the Jews notice it when he does it, right? Before Abraham was, I am, and they pick up stones to kill him, right? They see this blasphemy. Okay, so he just said two things. Not only did he identify himself as the Christ, the long way to king, the savior among, from the Jews, but he also said something more for those who have ears to hear. He also said he's not only the human king, but the long way the divine king is returned. Verse 27, just then his disciples came, and they marveled he was talking with the woman, but none said, what do you wish for? Why are you talking to her? So the woman left, right? And she left her water jar. She doesn't need her bucket anymore, right? She got her water. It's welling up into her etern to eternal life. And so she runs back to the, to the uh, village and says, come and see the man who told me all that I ever did. Can he possibly be the Christ? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples besought him, said, Rabbi, eat. And he said, oh, I'm not hungry. All right, so, oh, oh my goodness. Did he eat something, a, a Samaritan shawarma? I hope not. So what these, this, the disciples had been sent into the village to get lunch. And they come back. What did they bring back? Some olives, some hummus, a couple shawarmas. Here, 
Rabbi, eat. And I'm, I'm not hungry. I, I've already eaten. I have food of which you do not know. John, you don't think he... Peter, please, please tell me he didn't do it. He ate Samaritan food. Unclean. So, so the disciples said to him, has, has anyone brought him food? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Of him who sent me. And to accomplish his work. A little commentary on the disciples. He sent them in to Samaria. And they brought back a shawarma and some olives for Jesus. Look at what this woman's going to do. Do you not say there are yet four months and in the harvest? Peter, why is he talking about the harvest? I thought he was going to eat lunch. We brought this shawarma for him. He's not even hungry now. Now he wants to talk about the harvest. Yes, Jesus, it's four months until the harvest. I tell you, look up. The fields are ripe for the harvest. And as he says this, the whole village is coming over the hill. And as he, now he begins, says, now guys, get your sickles, okay? He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps, right? Jesus did all this work. He talked to one Samaritan woman, and that woman brought the whole village to Jesus. He sent in his 12 disciples, and they brought back a shawarma. And so he says, boys, get your sickles. The proverb is true. One sows and another reaps. Go ahead. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So now, now you, can, now you can harvest the benefit of what this poor Samaritan woman did instead of you. Many Samaritans from that city believed in them because of the woman's testimony. A woman's testimony? Yeah, look at the contrast. The woman went in there and said, maybe this guy's the Christ, and the whole village comes. What were the disciples doing when they were in there? Peter, should we get olives? Yeah, maybe olives. Let's get some hum no hummus. They probably smashed it with their hands. Disgusting. What about a swarm? I don't know. Who knows how they butchered the animal? Unclean. I don't know. Jesus said to get food. Let's just get someone to go. They brought back food for Jesus and didn't evangelize the Samaritans. Because the Samaritans, who would want to evangelize such people? Jesus spends time with a Samaritan woman, the lowest possible human being you could imagine if you were a Jew. And she converts the whole village in a few words. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of your words that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. Salvation is from the Jews. They realized that he's the long-awaited Christ. Now Jesus is going to leave there and go up to Galilee, where he's going to find a few people who are going to believe and a few others. He's going to go to Judea, and the Jews are going to try and kill him, stone him. He'll go back up to Galilee. You'll find that in John's gospel, Jesus goes to seek disciples to seek that lost sheep where the Jews, the Pharisees, and not even his own disciples would have thought to go. And Jesus has done that with each one of us. He has called each one of us from wherever walk of life we've come from, whatever town, whatever nation, whatever background we've all been called. How? We've received that living water. Jesus will tell them later on, Chapter 7, anyone who's thirsty, come to me and drink. He's the source of living water. That is the source of the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit in that context is to draw us, like ancient Israel, to the Word of God, to Jesus. Jesus will say to the disciples, you have the Spirit. This is chapter 14. And yet, you don't have it all. Right? The, 
the disciples are journeying toward the full understanding of who Jesus is. That will only happen, and they will only be given the fullness of the Holy Spirit after the resurrection in chapter 20 when he breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit, who sins you shall forgive are forgiven them. Most people today think of that as uh, a, a text which speaks about the sacrament of confession. And it does in a certain way, but not directly. That is John's baptismal text. That's the parallel text to the end of Matthew's gospel, go out and baptize all nations. The primary instrument which the church has to bring about the forgiveness of the sins of the world in the name of Jesus is by baptism. Peter said in chapter 2, Acts of the Apostles, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sin. And Jesus has given the disciples that power to go out and do that. You say, well, what about confession? Well, yeah, it's related to this. Confession is the restoration of our baptismal grace. Confession is the restoration of our baptismal grace. And Jesus has given his apostles, we know from the early church records, we know from the New Testament, we know from the early the, the fathers of the church, that the apostles and the bishops, the early church, when someone was baptized, and then when they really messed it up, they didn't rebaptize them. They refused to rebaptize. Once you've been baptized, you can never be baptized again. You, you are now eternally changed. You're a new creation. But like Adam, the old creation, you can certainly mess it up and lose your relationship with the Father. What do you do? You repent. And rather than be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, you confess that sin. And through the hands of the bishop or the priest, that baptismal grace is restored. Glory be to Jesus Christ with his eternal Father and his all holy good and life-giving spirit, both now and ever and to ages of ages. Amen.